So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I've, I've, even though I kind of started off doing Java back in the day, I've uh, been kind of doing C-sharp stuff since, you know, 1.0 and, you know, Visual Studio supported it, you know, doing fun, fun things like, you know, word automation, integration with Office, stuff like that. And um, obviously, hopefully I don't sound very Yorkshire, I think. Um, so I've been in Sheffield about eight years now and, uh, you know, kind of doing various jobs all over the place. I might have worked with you, I might have not. I've, sorry if I've forgotten your name. I've, I don't know. Um, now I currently work at uh, Skybet in Sheffield. Um, unfortunately, they don't do .NET Core, which is really a disappointment to me. But uh, as long as I can tell them to not use Node.js, it's fine with me. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a principal engineer over there. Um, uh, the big thing I like doing, sort of a hobby, is like through basically my entire career is trying to use as much as open source stuff as possible. Uh, just especially with, the, you know, ever since GitHub started, you know, just trying to participate in projects, you know, using things that other people use, giving back when I can, uh, you know, finding something that does, say, 90%, 80% of what I need, and then contributing back the last 10, 20%, because, well, why not? You know, somebody gave me some stuff, I should give some back. And so, um, so, so sort of back then I was like, what can I do? What, what's a good idea? What, I mean, um, I, have, I have no idea what is a good idea. I, didn't, I couldn't think of a good idea. Um, so I just kind of um, pottered along until like, um, I guess, you know, just thinking like I was a big comic book nerd back in the day, I guess still kind of am. Uh, you know, um, they, they have, uh, there's file formats, quote unquote, file format that's really just a, a compressed archive of images that's usually a, a RAR file but mostly a zip file and um, you know what kind of um, how can I uh, how can I use that because I just wanted to make my own viewer for myself not that I needed to but I wanted to so um, so the first thing was like okay realizing that you know the RAR file formats hard to deal with not many things can do it um, so I found a Java project that could do it called, well, fancily enough, JUnrar, because um, that's, well, not very inventive. But um, back at the time, you know, Visual Studio 2003, 2005, I can't remember which version, they used to have a um, Java to C-sharp converter. And um, so I uh, just ran it through that and <laughs> saw what happened. Uh, produced a huge mess of stuff. I kind of cleaned it up, but it got it to work. And so, um, so therefore, I could, uh, you know, Un UNRAR files, great. And so then um, uh, Silverlight 2 became a thing. I thought it was fantastic. Not everybody did. Um, but uh, like the biggest thing, you know, is I really liked it. It was, uh, it was actually cross-platform, you know. OS X was a first-class citizen. I mean, actually, the same runtime they built for Silverlight is what became .NET Core. Um, but, um, you know, obviously, browser plugins became not a thing anymore. And so, um, and so, like the, the my actual end goal was to create, you know, basically this image viewer is all, all it really is, and, but the source being a um, a compressed file. So, um, so I wrote I wrote it. It was kind of shitty, I will admit, uh, but it did work. And but um, you know I did it on and off for a little while. But the um, but really um, I did I did sort of spin out the compression part into its own library, which somehow people seem to actually start using at some point. Um, so, so um, I, at first I, um, I put it on, um, well, well, today, let's just go this way. So today, uh, it actually is used in some various places, like, you know, if you Google it or search on GitHub, you can find people where people have, you know, put it package or wholesale copy and pasted things. I don't know why people would do that, but they have. Um, you know, if you Google it, you, I can find lots of Chinese or I think Chinese pages that you know talk about it. I can't. I don't understand what they're saying, but there's other people that have used it as well. Um, I thought the coolest thing was that for a while in Mono, they put, put it completely in there as the zip implementation that was you know system.io.compression, the zip file. And of course, when you know Microsoft bought them and it became .NET Core became a thing, they well used .NET Core's implementation instead. And I've actually tried to look at doing that myself, but but um, well, there's various reasons why I didn't, but um, I'll get to those later. Um, one of the cool things is, you know, rock star John Skeet on, uh, of Stack Overflow, you know, contributed LZIP to, to it for some reason. I think mainly because 
This is one of the few libraries that actually has a uh, usable LZMA compression thing. And then, you know, LZIP being a, um, a file format that's relatively simple, he just decided to contribute it back. And so that was, that was neat. Um, for some reason, um, the, a lot of the time zone, the, the information that is used, needed for node to time itself is in an LZIP format. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, and then, like, um, I've had conversations with people from Octopus Deploy and, uh, and Duplicati as being, like, um, you know, things. I think Octopus Deploy, they fixed some bugs in the zip implementation. And I think one of the guys actually did the Deflate64 contribution, but I can't remember. But, um, well, hopefully I'll explain later maybe why my stuff is cool versus, you know, using some of the other, other slightly longer-lived uh, libraries and stuff like that. But um, some, of the, some of the things that I think my, my library can do that other things can't do is like obviously the raw file aspect, especially if you're dealing with just one deal with pure C sharp. Uh, there's not, there's, I don't think there's anything else that does it. Um, some of the scenarios where like you basically take a large, like some people somehow have video files that they may or may not have gotten in certain places. <laughs> um, they, um, they distribute them in certain ways and um, a lot of those ways end up being, you know, say 100, 155 megabyte RAR files as an as a ISO image or something. And um, one of the projects I ran it encountered was that the guy was, rather than having to decompress these things on the fly, they actually used C Sharp to mount them in Windows as an image and then using my library to just sort of read it on the fly as it, as it goes, rather than having to decompress it. And so it's just a more efficient use of space, you know, uh, just, just using CPU as it reads it and stuff like that. And, um, you know, another thing I like doing is, um, you know, rather than having to download a complete file to disk and then read it that way, you can, say, use a network stream and feed it directly into my library and then read the stuff out of that way. And so there's no intermediate ne buffering necessary, at least to disk. And so um, just, just stuff like that. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit of why it is. So, so uh, my initial version, I, like I said, I first did uh, UnRAR. Uh, I called it in UnRAR because I could not think of a cool name. Um, and it was on CodePlex because I actually think this still predated GitHub by a little bit, at least as a thing that I knew about. Um, you know, of course, CodePlex is no longer a thing, especially after uh, Monday's thing of Microsoft buying GitHub. Uh, but uh, the code, that can still, project still be there. Um, like I said, I think it was 20, 2003, converted to C Sharp. Uh, did a lot of cleanup, and I used it for my thing, but I was just like, well, since somehow I was more having fun dealing with archive formats than image files. I don't know why either one would be fun, honestly. Um, I just continued on. And so, um, so my thinking was, OK, well, obviously the next big thing, archive, archive formats being zip, being the next big thing, is um, how can I just deal with zip files and raw files in the same way? And so just playing around with it, you know, coming up with sort of a unified way to, to deal with that. And um, .NET zip you may or may not heard of as a project. There was also at the time like the, the IC Sharp guys doing their own thing. However, that was like GPL, so I couldn't touch that nor use it if I wanted to make my stuff GPL. Not that I'm against GPL philosophically, just that I didn't want to have that restriction on my stuff. Um, and so I just, you know, copy and pasted their stuff, cleaned it up a bit, and put it around my integrated API. I've done more rewrites since, but at the same time, it didn't need much. Um, you know, over time, I added tar support because, well, again, why not? It was I had free time. It's fun. I mean, like I, I keep going that way just because, as like, I feel like most people do open source stuff because it's fun to some degree um, at, at certain points of their time in the career. There's been times where I've been doing this project where I haven't touched it for over a year, uh, just because I didn't want to. Uh, but at the same time, there were other times where I did it almost religiously because somehow I find it interesting. Um, going back again, there are seven zip which I say ugh because I think 7 is a personally a very horrible archive format to deal with. Um, I'll get a little detail of that later if you're really interested. Um, but then, like I said, over time, there's also been uh, nice contributions. Um, like I said, John Skeet did the LZIP implementation. Um, if other people like, you know, do the de decryption, encryption for different file formats, um, which is not as straightforward as you think sometimes, especially zip being sort of a hodgepodge thing over time. Um, somebody just, you know, rewrote LZMA and uh, seven, some 7-zip seven parts because they had their own project and contributed back things like that. And so it's always interesting when people come out of a pull request out of nowhere with huge changes and uh, you're like, oh, this is great. 
But um, so I'm going to go into a bit of the design of um, uh, what I came up with as far as trying to make a you know a more unified way and a more performant way of dealing with archive formats. So um, so the like I said, the first idea was to um, just uh, figure out like because they're all basically the same thing. You'd have a file, you want to find all the entries in the file, you just sort of loop over it. Um, you know, you may or may not want to decompress the entry in the file. And, um, you know, the details of, you know, what compression format it is, um, you know, what the format is, just doesn't really matter. And so, um, and so that, was the, that was the thing. And so, like, um, you know, you want to you wanna make it easy to use as well, like, you know, at least as I saw, it's easy to use. Um, you know, especially using, like, the for each and uh, implementing an enumerator. Um, makes it sort of user friendly, uh, but um, well, as you see, there's one time I intentionally didn't do it, but I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, dealing with you know .NET stream objects instead of files. Um, well, I did that mainly because of of trying to just not be restricted to random access only on a file. Um, you can deal with if you deal with a sort of a for early stream. You sort of be able to get the benefits I was talking about as far as dealing with large files, dealing with network streams. If if the file format supports it, um, why not? Because it um, you can get a lot of certain benefits that way. Um, and so I've, I've implemented a lot of file handling things too. So that way, you know, there's just extension methods off of the base API, to where you know just does you know says file dot open to deal with the stream. You know, but most of the, a lot of, you know I recognize that the majority use case a lot of time is that you just want to pass it a file and just say open and deal with it. And then, um, and then also I have like also obviously when you want a unified API, you have to be able to detect what actual file format you use to do pro properly. So um, there's that whole sort of I have nasty well not I was about to say switch statement, but it's really more of a series of try catches because um, it's um, well it's just easier for me to deal with that way. So um, so like I said, um, there's um, random access. Um, basically, you have seekable streams. You can you change the position on it. You know call.seek on it, it move to different places in the file, um, you know, fi local file system being the classic case of where you, you can simply do that. However, in a lot of scenarios, you can have a forward-only stream where it'll, you know, the can seek will be false, and if you try to use it, try to use seek or position, it'll throw an exception. You know, network streams being that case, being the, one of the classic cases, I mean, other times, you know, like I said, with large, even large local files, Seeking across it can be very um, time-consuming, and so um, so my idea was you know just really dealing with forward on the forward-only case in game performance, in that case by just treating the file as a stream versus assuming that I can access it at any point in time whenever I wanted to, and um, and um, I say versus against uh, memory allocation optimization basically you know trying to go in and rewrite the code to deal with, you know, not trying to create a memory, as many memory arrays and stuff like that because, um, well, frankly, I kind of found that part boring and tedious. <laughs> and not as, uh, not to me, it's not as exciting as trying to create a, an easier way for me and hopefully other people to deal with um, file formats. Um, so, um, so therefore, it's sort of the API sort of evolved into sort of three uh, different aspects. Um, you have the, as I call the archive API, that's just random access. Uh, it's kind of the way you, if you've dealt with stuff, uh, you know, zip files and whatever it was before, you just, you know, say open, and you just have like an entries collection or, or files collection, even if they call it that, and just, you know, deal with it that way as a thing you can do at any given time. Uh, the, the forward only API <laughs> being reader and writer being two distinct use cases um, works slightly differently. They, um, you know, you, you can loop over them, but you can only go in one direction. And if you don't deal with the current file at time, well, then if you say move to the next one, well, you can't go backwards. Uh, I mean, it's not, um, it's not very hard, but at the same time, it can be not very straightforward when you're just dealing with different use cases, different points in time. And I also created, like, sort of just, well, static factory classes to where um, rather than having to knowing, knowing uh, which file format you're dealing with up front, you can pass it anything with any ex file extension and it just tries to detect it by, you know, reading the basic, most of the file formats have like a header in it that just say, you know, what type it is, which usually makes it pretty easy, but uh, sometimes they don't, so it's not, not as easy. Um, like I was saying with uh, the random access case, you can do uh, seek position length, you know, 
you, if you have a local file, that's, you can do that. But um, sometimes you're not, you might not want to, or just because in the very large file case, you're just moving across the file, especially if you have to decompress at the time, which certain file formats require the decompression at the same time, it can be very slow. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of the times the file formats are simple things like, you know, you have a header and then the trailing data afterwards and it's just a repeat of that over and over again. So, um, so with a local file, you can just skip the data and seek it. And, um, or, um, you know, you create a dictionary with all the entries in it and, um, and be able to loop over it that way. Um, zip, actually, Zip being a, one of the cases where it actually has a, a dictionary of the entries it has at the trailing end of the file. And so that way, um, you know, just if you want to read all the, know the entries in the file, you can skip to the end and just read the dictionary out without having to seek through the entire file and read everything. So, but, you know, most file formats like tar and raw and other things like don't have that. Um, but it does, but if you have a zip file, the my library reads it that way and uses that if it exists. Well, it always exists, but it just for zip it does. Um, the, uh, the actual random access use case does reuse the forward only stuff internally a lot of the times because, um, well, it's just, well, easier. It's re code reuse. You don't know how much of your data you've got. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of uh, yield return usage inside the code to make it, uh, you know, just st little finite state machines that, um, you know, don't know previously what happened. Don't, and then don't do too much work ahead of time. It only goes through and grabs it as you need it. And, um, and there's a, like a, and that goes back to the whole thing of, you know, trying to be performance through usage, only doing what you need to do at any given time versus, um, well, trying to do things up front in stages. And so, like, you know, the first stage being read all the entries, find them all. Second stage, you know, well, then decompressing them one by one. Just do it on each one on the fly as you read it. And that's, that's the sort of the philosophy we're trying to have a go forward on the API. Um, some of the issues that I've, I've ran along, uh, along the way, um, things like um, I create a class called rewindable stream. It's essentially because, you know, in the forward only case, if you're trying to figure out uh, what file format you're dealing with, and you have to read the header out, you need to sort of, you know, read like maybe four bytes, six bytes, 12 bytes, and then, um, and then if that doesn't work out, well, then you got to go to the next case and try to figure out what it was. And so in virtue, and they all deal with the stream class as sort of the contract in between the various sections of the API. And so I created one that's essentially a class called rewindable stream that just buffers a certain amount of data and then say at a certain point, say, just rewind, and so that way you can be tried again. And so um, hopefully it's usually just a very little piece of data, like for that use case, and then um, and it can go to the next uh, pattern and try it. Um, another thing was talking about just sort of the idea of stream ownership and, and like who is responsible for disposing these resources as it's created. So, um, you know, Microsoft, when they first created the, you know, IP APIs like well, stream read and stuff like that, when you just, um, you create, create a using statement and you want to, uh, you just say, you know, right, th like th right there it says, you know, var using reader, new stream reader, stream right there. Well, with that using that stream reader class, when it's disposed, it will actually dispose that stream right there at the end. Um, a lot of times, you don't want that. Um, it's actually sort of a sort of a bad pattern in that you shouldn't destroy anything you haven't created because you honestly don't know the use case. But obviously, in a lot of these times when you're just sort of saying, you know, new stream reader, file it open, blah, 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 it's a pain in the ass to write, you know, different using statements for each one. So I can see why they did it that way. However, especially with my library, it uh, makes it a bit difficult. And so, um, and so over the years, I've tried to figure out what was the best way to actually handle this, and I don't think I still figured out a good way. However, currently, um, I just made a class that's just called non-disposing stream that you just wrap streams around using that, and it just ignores the whole dispose call. Um, and because there's a lot of times when a lot of things internally, something wants to get disposed, and it shouldn't be because um, you'll destroy somebody's network stream or, or whatever when they're not done using it. Um, and then, uh, but this is, the, the exception is um, the writable archive. Actually, the archive API has a writing function for certain things like zip files. And um, a lot of times, you actually have to create an in-memory collection of streams 
before the actual write command is called. And so therefore, you can't dispose it at certain times. It's, it's a bit long-winded and complicated, but at the same time, you, you just can't dispose it that when, um, when normally you'd want to. Um, also, at first, I wanted to really be able to do, say, you know, especially in the Ford API, um, to uh, figure out how to, how to be as lazy as possible how to, and really use the enumeral pattern. But um, as I'll talk about a little bit soon, that the Ford only API just doesn't support, um, uh, well, it doesn't use the enumerable pattern, but at the same time, you know, iterating over a collection of entries in the archive API does. And so it's just slightly different. And so um, if you've been excited up until now, I'm about to get to the boarding part. <laughs> um, and so, um, so this is like the, the table that I have currently on GitHub as far as like what's supported and how. Um, I won't really go into that. Um, you can look at your viewing pleasure later. Um, but um, as you can see though, like this, the idea is that there's just a matrix of stuff that really a lot of, not a lot of it's consistent just because of the way the file formats are or, um, or just uh, legacy things is or you know, certain file formats uh, being, well, like sort of like, you know, gzip and bzip or whatever, sort of kind of being actually a file archive format because actually it's different compression. However, when people talk about it, they talk about it as a compression format when it's really not, but just because there's headers and when there's not headers, it's different. It's just kind of weird. It's just, you only learn these things as you get dive in deeply into these things. Um, but like I said, uh, when you're dealing with file formats, it's usually just a series of header and then data pairs. Um, you know, like I said, header, headers have metadata, like you, the name, how big it is, uh, just stuff like that. Um, and the data can be compressed or actually not compressed, like especially RAR, a lot of times people don't compress it um, just because they want to um, not, like especially when people are creating very large files, but they still want to distribute it in a you know, chunk the file into multiple multiple files for easy distribution, and they don't compress it just because it takes longer to do that. Um, there's a concept of you know internal streams or or solid, uh, as they call it, and it's more that's more about uh, taking a bunch of tiny files, and uh, you know giving each one a header, but if you compress each one individually, you you might actually end up with a larger file because a lot of times the compression algorithms actually add a certain amount of bytes just because of the way they work by, you know, trying to figure out dictionaries and things and look up tables and things. I'm, I'm not going to even pretend how to understand what they do because uh, I haven't actually ever implemented one of these algorithms. But, um, but so if you have tons of small files, it's more efficient to just sort of trail them, you know, header data pairs that are uncompressed and then take that entire trail of them and compress it in, in one go. And, um, and like 7-zip seven, seven being, uh, well, RAR supports this, 7 zip being that it always does this, which is why it's annoying. Um, and then, and then um, you know, another attribute is that you can have multi file archives. RAR does this, uh, zip files do this. I think 7 zip does this. And then uh, encryption being another big uh, thing, it's annoying because that always changes a lot about how, how different file marks do that. So I'm not very good at uh, implementing it myself because I, if I don't need it, I'm not going to bother. Um, and, um, and there's, and I think one of the key things to underscore, like I was saying a bit earlier, is that there's a, there is a difference between understanding what's a, a compression versus a file format. And so like, um, 7-zip, for example, usually can take a lot of different, uh, compression types, but most people associate LZMA with it. But, and so LZMA being where you really get good compression, but you can use that with zip. You can use that with, uh, well, LZIP being another file format. Uh, ZX or XZ being another one, which I don't know where they came up with that name. Um, but, um, and so, and, so, and like I said, with GZIP, you know, is actually deflate, which is what ZIP usually uses, but GZIP is a single file format that just has one, one uh, header on it, which is usually like a file name and the last modified time, I think, and that's it. So, um, so this is like, you know, the, there's my compression slide. Um, fancy stuff here. Um, like um, somebody contributed with ADC stream. That's some kind of Apple digital image format. I don't know why they did that. Uh, I accepted it because it seems neat, but it doesn't seem having seen any practical usage. Um, uh, like, I sort of, like I said, I've sort of made 
uh, decompression streams for like gzip, lzip, and xc and bzip. Um, but there's still at the same time, it's more about a convenience thing over uh, other things. Um, uh, I do have actually a, a RAR stream class uh, that just sort of invert, like, so the, the way that RAR is written didn't really make it easy to make into a stream class, but then I had a, I had a friend from Russia that did it for me, and so that was fun. But I should have put that up here. Uh, but RAR, actually, if you look at it, is a lot like PPMD, not that I know what that is either. Um, but just the way that it works is very similar, and so whoever wrote RAR, I think, just modified PPMD a little bit. Um, and so here we get in some details of what kind of what RAR is. And so, um, you know, way back even when I was a kid, uh, when, when RAR was a thing, um, it, um, you know, it was actually sort of the, somehow it was better than zip. I don't, uh, and people just started using it. I think mainly for the multi-file for, format aspect of it. And um, the thing about RAR though is that, you know, to, the un decompression code has always been open source while the compression code has been closed source. And, and so WinRAR or there's, I think we might have like a RAR executable as well. That's the only thing that can actually compress the, uh, the files. And, so, and um, but the file format itself is actually very simple. There's actually been sort of like six different iterations of it internally. Um, and it's just a simple like, you know, header data entry, nothing fancy about it, honestly. And, um, but that, it makes it um, really easy to have, you know, the, the reader API as I was describing as far as having the forward only aspect and being able to do fancy things like, you know, virtually mount ISOs from uh, multiple files. And, um, and so in that aspect, I kind of like it just because it's nice and simple. Um, so zip, sort of like I said, being sort of the, the next thing that I, I actually worked on myself. Um, zip's a old file format. Um, I think that's, that's the latest U official URL for the uh, spec of the file format being the, the app note.txt. If you just search for that, you'll, that's what it, that means. Is means uh, PKWare, <laughs> the PKWare zip file spec. I don't know why. Um, it's just been it's been a hodgepodge of things over time. They've just added various flags to support some different algorithms and adding different extensions like compression, things like that. But it hasn't really fundamentally changed over time. So um, that's good in that you know it hasn't fundamentally changed. But at the same time, it makes it kind of hard to deal with in certain certain aspects. But uh, one of the cool things that zip actually supports though is. Uh, the forward only, forward only writing in that you don't have to know the size of your file to write it uh, to a compressed file. Because typically when you're writing a file, you write the header first and you want to write, well, how big it is. But at the same time, if it's a forward only aspect, where you, especially if you get into a file from a network somewhere, you don't want to ask, you don't have no idea how big it's going to be or how big it is. And so um, Zip actually has where they have like some, an optional trailer uh, header, trailer header, uh, trailer data package that actually sort of, so at the end, you could have been counting bytes and say that, uh, say how many bytes it is. And so the, and so the header just says, you know, oh, it's going to have a trailer. And then in the trailer, you can actually read the data. And of course, the dictionary of the zip being at the very end as well, you can write that size into the dictionary too. So um, it's actually one of, it makes it more versatile than a lot of the other things, in my opinion. But um, yep, yeah, but it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, like 7-zip being sort of the new kid on the block, I guess, so to speak. Um, I, a lot of people seem to like it for some reason. I think it's just because it does uh, LZMA being um, a much better compression algorithm than a lot of other things out there now. Um, and it's just, everybody just associate with 7-zip. But um, as, as a person that's trying to read the archive format of it, it's, it's very complicated, annoying. Um, like everything is compressed. And at the same time, like I said, it also deals with things in streams. And so it's impossible to actually deal with in a forward-only aspect in that you have to deal it only with a local file and being able to seek across it to be able to get to, to the places that you need to go. Um, you know, maybe a lot of times it's not a big problem, but I think in a lot of scenarios it, it becomes an issue. And so um, I don't really recommend using it in like, you know, certain use cases, but that's probably a minority use case, who knows. But, um, but like I said, it's known for LZMA, however, as 7-zip as a format does support a lot of different uh, compression algorithms just like zip does, and that you just, 
just tell it the different header and, and it does a different algorithm. Uh, so tar is a file format that's been around forever as well. You might have seen like tar tgz, tar gzip as being, uh, if you know the old thing, a lot of times people are using like tar xz or tar bz2 or um, well hopefully now a lot of tar lzip. But um, it's really old in that every header is in, every, everything's in 512 byte chunks. I don't know why, I think it has to do with the fact that it used to be going old tape, tape drives and stuff like that, just because it was, it, those will be efficiently written, so that's how old it is. Um, so 512 bytes on a tape RT means you're about to run out. Yeah, yeah. That's why they did it. Yeah, well that makes sense. I mean like, yeah, like I said, I don't know why, but that, that's what I kind of remember reading, yeah. And um, you know, the, as, as specified, there's zero compression with it at all. It's just about archiving multiple files as one, which is what you would do on a tape drive. Um, uh, like I said, there's been extensions to it, like naming U star and PAX being two that I've known and I've have had, I've personally had to had to deal with in certain, certain ways. Um, it being relatively simple, you know, supports the different APIs that I want to support, so yay. Um, but next to that, um, people have taken, you know, these single file formats and just have sort of associated them with uh, tar files and just making them easy to deal with. And so um, these are like a, what I call just single entry archive formats in that there's a single header and then everything else after that is just data. And, um, and oftentimes, you know, people have compressed those, use that to compress a tar file. And that's how they do archive storage. Um, and like I said, like, um, so like I said, gzip behind the scenes is deflate. BZIP2 is BZIP2. It's sort of, a, you know, whoever made BZIP2 didn't really divorce the idea of the compression from the archival format, which is kind of annoying. So that's why it's, like I said, terminology-wise talking about it, it's a bit rough. And I've had a lot of my own personal struggles over time trying to sit, figure in my own mind how I was going to deal with one versus the other. I, I didn't know. Um, XZ, um, I don't know where that came from. Uh, it was just, I discovered that, you know, not too long ago. It was easy to, or somebody implemented it, or wanted me to help them implement it, and this kind of came around. But it's specifically being uh, LZMA2, um, and then LZIP being slightly newer, and you know, seems to be sort of more in favor. And like I said, there's a URL right there that tells you why you should not use XC, you should use LZIP, um, in case you're interested. Um, like I said, it's a very nerdy and niche thing if you're really interested, so. But um, like I said, it uses LZMA1, and somehow, LZMA1 is better than LZMA2. Um, that URL will tell you why. Um, that's what it says. I, I'm not really sure, but I just found it interesting being sort of a, you know, the the guy who made LZIP, you know, talking about just why that's bad. <laughs> but um, anyway, and so um, and so now I'll show some code samples, which most people want me to make, but I keep refusing to because I don't. I'm bored. Or I don't. I just feel like I don't have time to do it. But you know, I get pinged all the time on the internet about you know where are the code samples. I'm like, uh, look at the tests. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not very good in so far as you know making happy code for people. Um, well, yeah. I, well, I've always kind of known. Uh, it's just more of like oh, I'd rather watch TV than write code samples. I'm not getting paid to do this. So, uh, and so um, so here's sort of a pseudo, uh, mostly real example from some of my integration tests for the project that's talking about um, so doing the reader. So like, um, so there's a pseudo using statement there that's obviously not real, uh, but the reader factory calling open on the stream is real and returns a, a iReader object. That could be, you know, zip, it could be rar, it could be gzip, anything that supports uh, forward only reading. And um, and so I have that while statement right there. At first I was like, let me um, try to use just a for each statement on it. But I, I didn't like that in the aspect of the, what people kept trying to do or really think in the usage was that you know you do f say for each var entry on collection. People might store that entry object somewhere else. And in the for only scenario, that entry object quickly becomes invalid. Um, because you can't use a previous one when, when you move forward. And so I stuck with the idea of just saying, um, kind of like you know, ADO.net, and that you just have your, uh, your reader there, and you just say, move to the next entry, 
and you it's and you could have reader dot entry being the current one, and you could before you do you have to call move to next entry before you can access the current one, just like ADO.net. If anybody's way back in the day actually played ADO.net raw, um, most people use ORMs now, but that but that's what you had to do back in the day, and um, and so you just do while move to next entry. You know it's true, then. Um, uh, most of the things I can tell which one's a directory, which one's not. Sometimes it's as simple as seeing if the last character is a, a slash, um, especially for zip. And then, um, and then the right entry to dictionary right there is actually a uh, extension method. That's not the actual API on the reader, or because um, a lot of times people just want to do group things where they just want to, you know, write out everything in a, in a row. Um, like going back to my uh, comic book viewer example, what I wanted to be able to do was you know, get images out of an archive file. And sometimes there's a lot of them. And I didn't want to wait. I was impatient. And so I didn't want my UI to lock up as I was scanning over the entire file or, or even just waiting for it. And so I would do that over the image file, and I would get the first image immediately. And so you know, this was Silverlight, you know, WPF stuff. And so I could lazily, I could load that first and deal with it, and I could see the other images load in time. And I always thought that was neat. Um, so I just made sure that other people could. And so, and so that's that. So the next slide is showing more of, um, of sort of the lower level aspects of dealing with the reader. So, um, so if you actually want to get the current entry, uh, the data of the current entry, you just say open entry stream to get the data. Um, again, not having to worry about what the compression was or anything like that. And, um, and then so therefore you have a byte stream of the actual data and you can do with it what you want. Obviously, you'd want to write to a file usually, which is why there's a convenience method for it. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people like, you know, want to write it in memory just to deal with something because they don't want to have disk, you know, especially in the cloud world, you don't want to use local disk, stuff like that. But, um, and so like, you know, in my case, I wanted to write it to a memory stream and just bind it to an image viewer. I didn't want to put it on disk. And so, um, but that, that example right there is, well, is from, again, from my uh, integration tests I've got just to write it to a file and see things to it. And like that transfer to, it's just a shortcut around copy with a 80K byte, byte array, and use, actually uses a byte pool in the background as well to try to get some more efficiency out of it. Um, again, cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, so the writing, you know, is similar. You know, you know think you want to write a factory. You open it up, you can tell it what uh, archive type you want, what compression type you want. It'll throw an exception or something if it's unsupported. Um, and again, write all being an extension method to, um, to just make it easy for people to do, because that's, that's an area that's been identified you know, over time. Somebody said, I needed this, or contributed to it, and so I just put it in there. Um, and so you know, behind the scenes, it's just, like I said, again, deals with streams. It only, it only knows about, the raw API only knows about streams, and so it just uh, does its thing. And um, the archive, uh, the archive uh, API being a slightly different in that um, uh, I actually added, at one point, the, um, some e event objects. I don't really like this anymore, as far as an API goes. I, ch I break things all the time. Um, one thing is I never actually released a 1.0. And so it's eternally beta for like you know about 15 years. Um, um, it's really my own prerogative, I guess. You know, I guess that's the nice thing about being a benevolent overlord of this project. Um, but um, but like I said the um, the I, at one point I wanted and other people have asked for you know uh, progress, and so I can easily I can do that relatively easily. And so I have just classic .NET events on there. But at the same time, I think there might be a better way to do it, especially these days. Um, Again, the, the, this is actually using a for each, and so um, you know the entries being a collection, but it actually is behind the scenes that lazy collection in the background. So it actually fills it in as you go along, and you know being facilitated by yield returns, and so um, and so it's not actually trying to read everything all up front. It reads it as it goes, and um, you know using a little link there, and then doing the exact same thing. You know writing writing to a directory, to just um, as a typical thing, but. Again, write to directory is a, an extension method, not actually on the API. The on API would probably be, you know, um, open open entry stream again to do to do um, to put that stream of bytes where you wanted it to go. Um, 
There, um, there also there's um, uh, an archive, a writing archive support, um, like writable archive, I call it. I think only zip supports it. Tar does technically, but it, it's not very useful independently, so. so I don't think it's very much used. But at the same time, the API for that is, you know, you get, add entry, give it a name, a key. I try not to use the word file anywhere because the entries are actually just keys that if they have slashes in it, it might be in the subdirectory then. That's really all that means. There's no magic behind the scenes that make it safe as in a directory or not. And then, um, and then you pass it a stream as the source of the data you want to do. And then once you actually hit save or save to, to a byte stream, a different stream, then actually writes it all out in line then. And then, um, and so this is sort of my, a little bit of my uh, sort of open source wisdom, I guess, as I've gone over time. Um, you know, if you do a project like this, uh, you really have to like it. Um, don't go into it thinking that, oh yeah, I have this great idea, everybody's gonna love it. Nobody cared for like a couple of years, I think, for my thing. I just kind of did it on the side and then you sort of, some people came across it in the search engine or whatever and just said they thought it might use it. And so then I started getting some basic questions like how to use this. And so I had some basic documentation, you know, things like that. And um, uh, the most annoying thing are what I, in my mind, call the beggars. Um, they're just like, uh, especially when I, I get like emails saying like, oh, I have this deadline. Can you make this basic thing work? I, I don't even bother responding just because, well, first of all, they're trying to make me do something I don't want to do, especially by saying, you know, there's a deadline. But also it's just, um, you know, if they actually tried a little bit, they could do it. I mean, I, maybe that's sort of the wrong attitude to have as far as like, you know, getting this as a thing that I think people ought to use. But at the same time, you know, my free time is precious and this is not like a, this is not my day, day job, so to speak. And so if they're not gonna even bother trying to look at some of the code or some, especially some of the test cases or other things people have done by, you can do a, especially do you do Google search and there's examples on Stack Overflow. Not that I don't have examples on the GitHub site, I do have some, just not very detailed. Um, then then um, I'm not gonna bother. Um, one thing that's happened over time too is that um, people have actually offered to get donations, to give me donations for things. Like not even, say, not even saying like, you know, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you do this. It's more so, oh, it's great, you've done this for me. Um, here, can I give you some money? And I just, I, well, I, I just always refuse it. So, I mean, I, like I said, I'd rather, you, I'd rather you contribute something or just use it or tell me how you're using it. Because I'm always interested <laughs> in see how people are actually are using it. But um, I don't like, I, but if I, I feel like if I accepted money, I'd be somehow obligated to, you know, do something if he asked something in the future or whatever. I mean, the best thing I got right now is I have a full-blown JetBrains license because of my open source stuff. And like I can use any JetBrains product, and that's fantastic actually. But um, besides that, I don't accept anything. Um, but, um, but over time though, like, you know, I've also had, you know, significant users or con contributors that have asked me for things. And I've actually felt I've needed to help them because, you know, whether they're helping me directly or helping other projects or whatever, I, I want to sort of help the overall sort of open source ecosystem do their thing. And so that's, you know, just being a good citizen type thing to where you, um, if they're helping their neighbor, you should help you, them if they need something and, and, you know, and they'll come back. And so, like I said, I think I've gotten some good usage out of it, you know, especially when, you know, the mono project just I used it at one point, um, stuff like that. So um, thing, and then, um, some final notes, um, like I said, so I had a Russian friend contribute some stuff like 10 years ago now. Like it was just like we were going back and forth over emails for like a year, I don't even know who he is. Um, I haven't talked to him in years either, but it was just funny how you just sort of build a relationship of, with people that way. Um, you know, a feather in my cap, John Skeet did something. I just throw that name out there a lot. People seem to know who that is, so. Um, Deflate 64 being a, a oversight that I had, you know, somebody contributed it. It wasn't, it wasn't really a, a hard thing to do, but I just personally had, had the need for it and they did. And so I emerged it right away. Um, somebody took it upon themselves to actually try to report the entire under our code base over. Um, really this was in reference to doing RAR5, the RAR5 format, which, you know, has been out for a couple years now, I think. And I just never got around to doing it, mainly because it's, it was hard, um, but they—they they actually—it was actually—it's actually sort of incomplete. 
they did the raw five parts and some other parts, but not everything. And so I've kind of mashed it together with the old code base and the new code base with a nasty if statement somewhere, and it works. And so sometimes it's just neat to see things. Even though it's a complete kludge and it looks horrible, and like, you know, if I was doing a code review of work, I would not accept it. Um, well, I do in here. Um, so, you know, like I said in the future, I always beg people for help if they, um, if they want to, especially if they, this might be something mildly interesting, or I don't, at this point I would say I don't know how it's interesting, but um, you, know, you never know. Um, but it is, I think, you know, definitely the use case of it is useful as far as like, especially like dealing with, you know, the forward only aspects, which I don't think any other library out there does natively. Um, but then like, you know, there's some earmarked things I've put on there. It's like, you know, multi-file zip support, occasionally get bothered about that, which I've never bothered doing. Um, you know, there's always niggles about different encryption or decryption aspects um, that I just haven't implemented. Um, and mostly I haven't implemented, other people have contributed. Um, there's still a lot, there's a good tidy up to do. Maybe like, you know, you could even want to, if you want to like just go through and reformat code to make it look prettier or write some documentation or whatever, there's always stuff like that to do. Um, people always like trying to do perf performance things. And so like, you know, just measuring it through um, benchmarks, looking at how many byte arrays you created and just trying to reduce that count. I recently had one to where a guy got uh, LZMA slash 7-zip to work a lot faster because he just decided to implement read byte on every byte array because the default implementation creates a, a new one byte array each time. And so, yeah, that does suck. And so I see why he did it. And um, I, I never thought about it doing it or had a desire to do it. And so, but at the same time, I merged it right away because it was a clear win. Um, testing could always be better. We always can be better everywhere. Um, right now, I primarily run things through integration tests just because I have an array of files that I deal with and I just have different tests that go over the different file formats and just assert different things. And I use, you know, AppVayer and I use CircleCI as, as two different type things to just read things. However, the file systems, those are unreliable, so they often fail. And um, I'm 90% sure it's because they're unreliable. Like, they work locally, they just don't work there sometimes. So if I rerun it, oftentimes they pass. I'm just assuming it's because of that. I could be wrong. Um, one thing I would like to do in the future, actually, is, you know, just double down on .NET Core stuff, because I like .NET Core, and actually use the new span and memory APIs and probably get a lot of, a lot of wins that way. However, that's a complete overhaul of just about everything. So um, uh, that's definitely a long-term uh, thing to do uh, if anybody wanted to do it, because I'm not sure I ever will. Like I said, I, know, I recognize that uh, compression algorithms and uh, archive formats aren't the sexiest thing in the world, but um, what, I, what I really enjoyed doing it was just, you know, creating an API over something I needed to do and um, just running with it and see what happened. So, thank you. <laughs>